The Lord is truly good to us because um, as we study during our Sabbath school lessons, He gives us a lot of opportunities to improve. As we discussed in the uh, review lesson, in the, in the study lesson, it was touched, and we discussed this in our family worship. Did God punish justly Cain? Or did Cain deserve a punishment? You know, I wrote in my Sabbath school that even though he punished him, it was a punishment with mercy. Because by the right, he had to take, he had to take away his life because he took away someone's life. But God allowed him to live. Maybe gave, he gave him an opportunity to repent. We don't know exactly what was the story of Cain later on because we don't have a record. But I would like us to talk today about the uh, character building opportunities in the light of, um, specifically in the life of Peter. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 through 24 and let's see when Paul is describing the old and new character or the old and new man, how is he describing him? Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 through 24. We have a bit of Bible verses, so we would like to have participants. If you have the verse ready, please stand up and read the verse for us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. All right, so let, let's meditate a little bit upon this verse. How do we gain old character? Or do we gain the old character at all? It already hey, we already have it because it's hereditary. It's a fallen character. But how are we encouraged to cultivate the new character? What does it say there? Anything specific points out? What does Paul point out about the new character? That it has to be cultivated. It's not hereditary. This character we need to inherit and we inherit by cultivating or by educating ourselves. There are two distinctions between the old and the new character. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21. What are the fruits of the flesh or what are the fruits of the old character? Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21. <clears throat> it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and what is that word? Lasciviousness. Adultery, witchcraft, hatred, various, ruinations, wrath, strife, subdiction, heresies, heresies, <laughs> envy, murders, drunkenness, bellings, and such like, of which I tell you before. As I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, so we given here a full description of what the old character may have. Not necessarily maybe all of these features at once, but any if our character has any of these features, we what is how does the verse end? That they cannot be in heaven. So let's look at the new character or the fruits of the spirit let's go to the same chapter verses 22 and 23 let look let's take a look at the contrast between the two verse 22 and 23 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law all right so we can see that there's a very clear distinction between the two. They have nothing to do with one another. And we are encouraged to educate ourselves in such a way that we will be found in the later category. So the old man, who does it represent? We talked about this in the Sabbath school. We touched this a little bit. Who do we represent when we have an old character? We represent Satan. And there is no place for such one in heaven, according to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. 
If someone can read that for us, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Thank you. So, again, it's reiterating the same point. The old character or the old defects, if we have those, we cannot be in heaven because we have not uh, gone through the transition. So, by inheriting the new character or the character of Christ, this will give us the credentials or this will give us the path to enter in the kingdom of God according to John chapter 3 verses 3 through 5. John chapter 3 verses 3 through 5. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. All right. So look at this verse. Let's, let, let's stop a little bit here and let's take a look at this verse. There has to be a certain transition or a certain transition has to happen in order for us to become someone new. So we need to realize that the old or carnal man has to die first before we can be resurrected into the new life. What happens during the baptism? A new man is born. A new man is born. A new man is born. We call it the watery grave because you submerge as one creature and you resurrect it as someone different. You still the same man. But spiritually speaking, we have the ability to become someone new. Because the old man, with the traits of character that were listed in Galatians chapter 5, is dead, does not exist anymore. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be tempted. It doesn't mean that we are born already perfect. But it means that we, under the, under the new covenant, or as we are resurrected into new men, we have a better opportunity to be those who will enter the kingdom of heaven. So this um, man's old nature, having these hereditary tendencies, they have to be changed. Former habits have to be given up. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. What do we find in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3? But ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. All right. So when we die, what happens with us? Our life is changed. Our life is merged with the life of Jesus Christ. And it says, and your life is hid with Christ in God. The apostle here refers to a death to sin. The death of the carnal mind and not the death of the body. So we need to understand that whenever we are born again, it's not physical death and physical resurrection, but it's the spiritual resurrection. Because our condition is very, very dramatic. Uh, Romans chapter 7 verse 4, what does it say? Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. It's a very short verse, but it's a very meaningful verse. Romans 7, 4, so, sorry, 7, 14. Okay. Well, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Okay, so the human race is carnal and is sold under sin. So what, what we're establishing so far is that I, in my body, as of right now, as of today, cannot find salvation. Can I? I can't. Because everything that we've listed so far points to the fact that whatever I do, whatever I find myself doing, is the work of Satan. Because we are born in this world and we are born with hereditary tendencies towards evil. And when we find ourselves in that hole, we apply for help to Jesus Christ. 
And when we find this help, only then we can be changed into someone different. Let's go to Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. <clears throat> well, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, Blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. All right. So what needs to happen is we need to crucify our flesh. Just a minute to the church, Romans 5, it says, If Christ be within us, we shall crucify the flesh and affections and lusts. I'm not going to go into the details, but let us actually come and look at the life of Peter. There are three points that I would like to mention today and three things that we need to undergo in our life, the same as Peter did, in order for us to become that new creature. So, point number one, we must submit. So, Peter learned how to submit. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Yes. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and talked them, saying. Okay. So first of all, we Peter was Peter learned the submission. As we read here, the disciples came and they sat down and they were learning from Jesus Christ. Let's go to Matthew 18 and verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and forgive him? Till seven times? Okay. So it wasn't easy for Peter to listen because we know that uh, fr from, from different verses, but we know the story of Peter. He was the disciples that couldn't sit in one place still. He was continually jumping to conclusions. He was continually doing something. He would, we hardly find him in the Bible sitting still. So we can see um, as we will go on, that Peter had to learn to submit before he, he could continue on with his journey. In Matthew chapter 26, I'm running a little bit of myself, but we can read this verse. Matthew chapter 26, verses 51 and 52. After they uh, captured Jesus Christ, and Peter was among those that were trying to protect Jesus Christ, what happened there? Matthew chapter 26, verses 51 and 52. Oh, one of them, one of them, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword unto his place, for all that they take, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than four legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Okay. So let's look at it again from a different light. Here's Peter. He has a really intemperate character. He is ready to defend Christ. Why do you think he was so eager to protect Christ at that point? Let, let's go back. I don't have the verses here, but let us uh, think about it. When disciples saw Christ, when he fed 5,000 people, what were they looking forward in Christ? Let, 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 to be relieved from 
the rule of the Romans? Yes, Josh. Uh, during the time between Malachi and Matthew, there were 400 years, and during those 400 years, lots of false prophets po popped up saying, oh, the Messiah is going to come, he's going to kill all the Romans, he's going to set us free. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the disciples were actually looking for that in Jesus, and when that didn't happen, they were disappointed in someone. Okay, very good. Yes, this is exactly what is happening here. So here's Peter. He comes to Christ. Christ calls him, calls himself uh, as his, okay, Christ. he comes to Christ, he submits to Christ, he's listening to Christ, he follows Christ, and at the same time, he's still the same Peter. He is still in temperance, he still doesn't really believe that Christ is the Messiah, he doesn't really understand what is the mission of Christ, etc., etc. So at this instance, when they, they captured Christ, he... He, his mind is blown away. How is he, who is supposed to be our king, is being captured? So he physically tries to defend Christ by cutting this man's ear. And Christ tells him that, look, put away a sword because this is not the way. My kingdom is not of this world and this is not how we need to go about this. Mm -hmm. So here's Peter, who is learning the lesson of submission. But he didn't really learn this lesson until later on. Because, let's go to John chapter uh, 6 and verse 66. John chapter 6 and verse 66. Let's look at different instances a little bit. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And 67, 68. Oh. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. What, what did Peter say right now here? So he realized that, look, by, by me, by myself, I can't really do anything. So somewhere deep inside he realized that Christ is someone more than a prophet. Mm -hmm. He's someone more than a, just a king or just, uh, just a man who is feeding people. So... He realized that he needs to stay with him. So that's lesson number one. Peter learned to submit. Lesson number two, <coughs> Peter learned how to serve. Let's go to Mark chapter 6 and verse 7. Mark chapter 6 and verse 7. Mark chapter 6 verse 7 says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Alright, so this is what Peter is learning here. Peter is learning responsibilities. He is learning to cast out demons, he healed the sick people, he preached people who were not converted, he healed the lame, he helped the poor. So Peter is learning to serve the master. Just like Peter learned to submit first and then to serve, the same experience has to be ours. Because we cannot just come to Christ and declare that I want to be a disciple or make me a disciple. There has to, we have to take some steps in order to achieve the same level as Peter did. As we go, as we will get closer to the, the to our at the end of our study, we'll see how did the spirit, how did this experience turn the, uh, the life of Peter. But let's go to Luke chapter sixteen and verse ten as well. Luke chapter sixteen and verse ten. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Alright. So we, how can we apply this verse or how can we, let's look at this verse in the life of Peter. First, God calls him. He gives him um, certain duties. He performs his duties. And as his life progresses on, God gave him a greater and greater responsibility. And the third point that I would like us to take a look at is um, Peter's, uh, Peter, how Peter learned to surrender himself. 
Let's go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Thank you. So this is already running a little bit uh, a different scenario, but the fact is that on what condition did they receive the Holy Spirit? What was the condition that they had to achieve in order for them to receive the Holy Spirit? They had to be witnesses. They had to be unity. They had to surrender. So if they didn't surrender their old character, or if they didn't change their own uh, behavior, would they be able to receive the Holy Spirit? No, no because that's, that's not how it works. So this verse applies to us as well today. We need to learn how to surrender first if we want to have Jesus in our life. We must to surrender all aspects of our, of our life. Our will to be His will. As it says in Ephesians chapter 6, 6, as slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. In James chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, do not merely listen to the word as do and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. It is not enough just for us to read the Bible, just to come to church. It wasn't enough for Peter just to be the disciple. That wasn't it. That was the beginning. That was a good beginning. But in order for Peter to learn his lesson, he had to surrender his will. He had to submit himself to Christ. And then he had... To, oh, I'm sorry. So the first step, he had to submit to the will, to Christ. He had to serve Christ. And when he learned how to serve him, he needed to learn how to surrender to Christ. Um, one doctor said once, you do, not, you do not get stomach ulcers from what you eat. You get ulcers from what is eating you. And a different pastor, he said, um, those who are extremely anxious wear themselves out and become their own executioners. So if we today do not learn to surrender ourselves to Christ, then the prince of this world, which is Satan, he will get the best out of us. He will take us to such an extent that we will, we will be beyond the point of no return. But Christ, he wants us to stop us as he stopped Peter. As he stopped Peter because he's, um, I mean, this is a bit of a different scenario. Why do you think when Peter uh, drew his sword, he didn't do more damage? at that instance. I was reading um, as I was preparing for this study and the paragraph in the Spirit of Prophecy says that if Peter would have um, done more damage then Christ would have been condemned to a greater punishment. But God, we can see that God was in every instance. Even in that instance when Peter was possessed by something else, by someone else, God has stopped him and he prevented him to do a greater damage. So, as we look at the life of Peter, let's go to, again to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 and through 23. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou servest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Okay, so here Peter is trying to rebuke Christ. He's trying to stop him from what his plan was initially. Number two, 
Let's go to Matthew, uh, to John chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. John chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. As they were in the upper room, they were getting ready for Lord's Supper. Peter prevented Christ from doing something. John chapter 13, 4 through 8. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. All right, so first instance, Peter is trying to rebuke Christ. Second instance, God is offering, Jesus Christ is offering to wash his feet and he turns him away. And what is the third part? Let's go to Matthew chapter 26 verses 74 and 75. Matthew chapter 26 verses 74 through 75. Then he began to curse and to swear saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out, he went bitterly. Mm -hmm. All right, so this man that we are still talking about here, Peter, has he gone through those steps here yet? No. Not yet, not yet, because look at this. Peter denied, he denies him. He swears that I don't know that man and immediately a rooster crew and after these words This is the the culmination of his life and Peter remembered the words of Jesus Which were said unto him before the cock crew thou shalt deny me thrice and he went out and wept bitterly Christ object lessons comments on this in page 152 it says <coughs> when the crowing of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ surprised and shocked at what he had just done he turned and looked at, at his master at that moment christ looked at peter and beneath the grieving look in which in which compassion and love for him were blended peter understood himself he went out and wept bitterly that look of christ broke his heart peter had come to the turning point and bitterly did he repent his sin he was like the publican in his contrition and repentance, and like the publican, he found mercy. The look of Christ assured him of pardon. So this is what it all leads to. First, Peter submitted to Christ. He came to him, he became his disciples. Second, he surrendered his will. And... and so, yes, second, he served him, and third, he surrendered his life. And only at this instance, when Peter denied Christ, he realized that he cannot continue in his nature. Amen. This is where Peter realized that his old character took the best out of him, but Christ offered him a different solution. He offered him a different exit. God is more concerned with your direction than he is with your perfection. So Jesus Christ, he wants us to become perfect. But at the same time, we cannot become perfect if we're still going on in a different direction that's where we're in. Okay. He wants us to continue in a different direction that we are going to. Let's go to Psalms chapter 40 and verse 8. It's a very short verse, but it has a very deep meaning for us. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 40 and verse 8. David realized this after he made his mistake. And what did he say here? Psalms 40 verse 8. Uh, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy Lord, is within my heart. 
Before we are converted, we delight to do our own will. We like to do things for ourselves. But there are th things that contradict the law of God. There are things that go against with the will of the Lord. And when that breaking point happens in our life, as it happened in Peter's life, as it happened in David's life, then we can say that I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is written within my heart. Today, each one of us is invited to be under the new covenant. Because what is, what is the promise that is given to all of us? That I will take the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you what? A heart, a heart of flesh. A heart that feels. A heart that realizes the need of someone else. A heart that realizes that there is God who can change, uh, who can perfect us. Let's go to John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18 and verse 23. John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18 and verse 23. Good. John chapter 14, 16 through 18. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Verse 22. 23. Oh, 23. And Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode. I'm sorry, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. There has to be a change. Someone else has to knock at the door of our heart and has to come in and clean that garbage within our heart. We cannot do it by ourselves. Peter thought that he could do it by himself because he was really sincere when he said, God, if anyone, I will never do this, I will die for you. And that same evening, when he betrayed Christ, he realized that by himself, he cannot do anything. Mm -hmm. My wish and prayer today, that this experience that Peter had can be our experience as well. Uh, Psalms chapter 119, verse 142, it says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, Thy law is the truth. The truth can set us free. The word of God can give us the direction. And if we learn how to obey Christ today, <coughs> if we learn to walk in His path, this is what will grant us the passport to heaven. Uh, Christ Object Lessons 315, it says, God requires perfection of His children. His law is a transcript of his own character, and it is the standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law. And when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments then the Lord can trust them to be the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Yeah. Our character has to be changed. But our character cannot be changed in an instance. Our character... When you think of the word character, what, what, do, you, what do you think of? Behavior. I'm sorry? Behavior. Behavior. What else? Thoughts, feelings, motives. Thoughts. Thoughts okay. Behavior, integrity. Responsibility. Very good. So when we think the word character, we need to think of something nobler. The, because when Christ says that we need to perfect our character, it's not going to happen in an instance. It's like a tree. The tree has to grow in order for it to become this mighty tree. The same thing with us. Our character cannot be changed overnight. So my wish and prayer today that we realize this sooner than later, so that we have a chance to become the new creature, so that we have a chance to have those 
fruits of the Spirit as they were listed in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 so that we, you and I, can have that opportunity to be in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.